All right. Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John and Rob. Hello. Hey. And this week, Rob is going to share a story. And Rob, why don't you tell us what it is? It is Victory Lap by George Saunders. I believe it's about uh, five, six years old. Yeah, thereabouts. And I chose it because it's uh, the language and voice are incredibly fun and quirky, and it's kind of a it's kind of an epic mo- uh, ep- epic movie, epic story. Once you kind of, once it starts hitting them, once kind of the the tires hit the road there after the first section. Mine says that it's from two thousand nine, so you're pretty old, Rob. Wow, ten years old. Yeah. All right, go for it. He tore off his socks. It was absolutely verboten for him to be in the main living room area barefoot. Mom and dad coming home to find him Tarzaning around like some sort of white trash would not be the least fucking bit. Swearing in your head? Dad said in his head. Step up, Scout. Be a man. If you want to swear, swear aloud. I don't want to swear aloud. Then don't swear in your head. Mom and dad would be heartsick if they could hear the swearing he sometimes did in his head. Such as... Crap, cunt, shit, turd, dick in the ear, butt creamery. Why couldn't he stop doing that? They thought so highly of him, sending weekly braggy emails to both set of grandparents, such as... Kyle's been super busy keeping up his grades while running varsity cross country, though still a sophomore, while setting aside a little time each day to manufacture such humdingers as cunt, swaggle, real fuck. What was wrong with him? Why couldn't he be grateful for all that mom and dad had done for him instead of... Cornhole the ear, cunt. Let's stop there. (laughs) (laughs) Before it gets any worse. I think think it got as bad as it could. (laughs) Oh, uh, the next one. Yeah, that's why I stopped. <laughs> this is, it's not a filthy story. Rob just picked a filthy section. Well, I, I just picked that section for a reason beyond just wanting to say those words on a podcast. It, this seems like, um, to give story background, there's two teenage characters and something really violent happens to them. And the first one's with a young girl and she's easily the happiest character you'll ever meet. She's kind of, she's at one hand, she's the picture of innocence, but I would argue that she's really the picture of ignorance. She's, she's 15 years old. So she's not a babe in the woods. This is a a teenager in contemporary America. And she seems to have this viewpoint that everybody in her town is kind of there to function as just to, to kind of reflect her philosophy in life that everything is perfect and wonderful and joyous. And she's, she's plenty intelligent. We're in her head, just like we're in Kyle's head. And we know that she's not adult. And so when we get with Kyle, however, I would say that he really is actually the picture of innocence. But I think the difference between ignorance and innocence here is that with ignorance is more, um, I think you're more ripe for violence there, or you're more vulnerable. And not just because she's a girl, but because when the villain comes and knocks on her door and there's a forced entry scene, she's... I don't think Kyle would react the same way, whereas Kyle does not seem ignorant. When you're in his head and you hear all that swearing, there's some rage and there's some violence there. So this guy, this kid is of the real world, whereas Allison is in this kind of dream world where she's imagining things, which is fine on its own, but I think it sets, it's kind of sets her up to make her even more vulnerable. Yeah, and maybe this is kind of explaining things too, but Kyle, like you said, he might be innocent, but he's not ignorant. He is pretty aware of the rules that his family has for him and... Whether or not they're ridiculous, he knows that they're not normal. So he at least knows that there's something separate from this life that he's given. So there's all these rules that you'll read about where he's not allowed to do certain things. Like he talked about Tarzaning around, (laughs) which is obviously one of his parents' terms, but they don't want him going outside. They don't want him interacting with strangers. And maybe the best example of that is what he does at the end, which is go outside of those rules because he's aware of what happens in that real world and that it's not all adhering to these rules. Mm -mm. This was a really fun one, though. Even though it's violent, it was like some kind of awesome revenge story or you were hoping that something really good happened and then it did the the plot even took me by surprise the fact that there was a plot i feel like for a very long time in this story we were just kind of visiting with these characters Mm -hmm. i had almost forgotten that someone knocked on her door when that section ended so why'd you like it though uh the voice number one his language is so quirky and fun and kind of strange and bubbly and the sentences the sentences seem kind of restless and they kind of leap out of each other and two sentences could be one and three sentences could be two and it's fun to see someone it, it just there just seems to be this kind of vibrating quality to, to his language which is just right up my alley in terms of just how do i in my own stuff i'm just constantly looking for how do i make sentences more interesting and to see somebody as the stuff that i read to see 
somebody who's just there's really no there's no there's no breaks on this guy like he hit he really hits the ground hard and even though i agree with christine where you're just kind of you're kind of hanging out with the with the first character but while he's doing that he establishes character so immediately just by by voice alone and i think it's kind of a master class in how how do you establish voice how do you say how you how do you establish character and it's through the style and it's through the voice and he does it just so quickly and it's really impressive how he does that well and from that snippet you guys can tell that it, this is first person stream of consciousness basically and i think that's a quick way to do it right hey, it's third person Th- third person um but it's but it's in but it is stream close, of consciousness yeah, yeah close third person for both so so first you're in her head and then and then you're in kyle's head and that's a, that's a really quick way to do it right to do it closely like that yeah like you were talking about um the parents commands those uh He's internalized those commands so much that when we hear them, they are in his own thoughts, right? And that's how we, we learn about him. That's part of the, um, the way he's characterized is by the way in which his thoughts dominate. The commands that his parents have given him dominate the way he thinks about things and the way he, uh, understands and reacts to things. Yeah. When you started reading that section, Rob, I was like, Oh, this might be difficult for folks to catch on, but you know, his dad's jumping into his yeah. thoughts and everything and the voices help. Obviously, Rob mm-hmm. likes doing voices, but, um, <laughs> (laughs) That was at first kind of hard to read. And then once you're in it, it's crazy how quickly your brain kind of adjusts and you're reading it the right way. And you realize he's impersonating his his dad when he's thinking or it it was really fun that way. Once you're along for the ride, like you said, like and once the tires got on the ground for the plot, um, you were almost the way that it was written almost didn't matter because I could see what was happening so clearly, which is kind of hard to believe if you read the first couple paragraphs. I was I didn't feel like I had any footing in this world because she's just describing things and they're so off the wall and I was trying to get a sense of what was real and then by the end I can see everything vividly I pretty much know what's real and that of course the grand reveal there this is a spoiler is that the takeaway is she struggles with what might have happened or could have happened and didn't happen so she's still stuck in this other reality right she she still can't even reconcile what really did happen because of what could have happened that was cool yeah the story really had a fairy tale aspect for me where you have kind of beyond the the damsel in distress and kind of the unlikely young hero but it was nice to see what fairy tales generally don't give you is you don't get in the villain's head and i think that's something that saunders usually does pretty well as as cruel as the stories sometimes are he always gives you each side and that's kind of some really unusual uh empathy on his part so it's nice to see that the the uh, the villain may even does he have a name he does yeah like russ or roy or something yeah it's something kind of anonymous sounding but he's dealing with a father figure in his own mind too so it's interesting to see kyle's obviously got his own issues with his dad and then to see kyle kind of pull up at the last second at the end and this is a major spoiler where he has the chance to kill the guy at the end but he doesn't, and he doesn't kind of cross over and kind of feed into that. I mean, Kyle seems, I would say a lot of this rage, I mean, it's, it seems directed at his dad. I mean, when you can't get a voice out of your head and you're having conversations with it and you're swearing at it, as fun as Saunders makes it sound and as comedic as it is, I think it's still kind of a serious issue that this kid's dealing with. Not that he's mentally ill, but this is something that dominates his thoughts, obviously. There was that moment at the end of the first section where we're in his head. I finished that section. I was like, how? I haven't been in the, I haven't seen the father on stage. He's only been in um, Kyle's thoughts, but I hate him. Yeah. I hate this guy. (laughs) He's like, He's he's terrible. Yeah. And somehow that's been conveyed through uh through just the way in which he intrudes on his son's thoughts. Mm. Yeah, he's Kyle's living in an institution. You walk in, the shoes are off, you have to check a weird counter that says when the parents left. Everything is regimented to, to almost each step that he takes. So the the violent act at the end seems as much against the guy that's trying to just trying to rape his friend as it does against just I'm so sick of kind of my existence at this point. And he used his his running that his father doesn't really care for Mm -hmm. as the tool by which to accomplish the feat, right? He's like, I'm going to run. Look at the way I run. Look how fast I am. No one else could have run that fast and gotten to that point and done that thing. So he's already, he's starting, just the act itself is just breaking away, yeah. And that's just what it is too. It's an act itself. He's running in spite of what he's thinking. All of a sudden, I'm running. What am I doing? I'm running through the creek. I'm carrying this thing. Oh my God, I'm going to kill this guy. So it's, it's fun to see a character's, you don't really see this a lot, where a character's body takes over and his thoughts are kind of elsewhere behind him, which is really exciting. Because it's kind of disorienting too, which is obviously what the character's feeling. Yeah, th- this is stream of consciousness done by a master. Yeah. We're, we're in the hands of a, a virtuoso. Yeah. 
So we apparently have nothing else to say about <laughs> Yeah, that's it. No, there's, there's, you know, we can say things, but. <laughs> no, we'll still say things, uh, <laughs> George. What did you guys think of this? Was the um, introduction of violence or just forget violence, just danger? Was that surprising to you guys? Because it, yeah. it threw me for a loop. It reminds me of something and I can't put my finger on it. And maybe that's why I, when you said fairy tale, that felt right. Yes. Because so many of those start with that premise of innocence. Mm. And it's innocence being introduced for the first time to the cruelty of the world, but in the most violent, direct way, right? Like Little Red, Little Red Riding Hood doesn't hear a story for the first time about someone getting snatched by a wolf. She gets snatched by a wolf. And I don't think that's always how it happens, right? Not everyone has a story or a point in time when they lost their innocence. We like to say that as writers, right? And that was the day in hindsight. It's like, well, maybe that's really poetic. But I think maybe for most people, it's slowly and you hear about things that have happened. And then in these fairy tales and situations, situations like this, it's just all the more devastating when you, the reader, are privy to the world as it is, and then you watch it happen in like the most violent way. So yeah, it was jarring because not everybody gets a random visitor who tries to rape and kill them. And and certainly not by a knock on the door. I think one other thing is a lot of fiction nowadays or contemporary fiction, I don't know, it kind of feels like small drama. Yeah. It's not like this life and death, you know, struggle for survival stuff. Whereas in a fairy tale, the small drama is externalized, right? The, the, your internal struggles become external struggles. Uh, so you have to fight against monsters because those are, you know, your interior demons become exterior monsters that you have to overcome. Metaphors. Exactly. Yeah. So whether or not that's this is a metaphor, you know, is debatable, but to be so such a large event, such a calamitous event, seems it's unexpected in fiction and mm-hmm. in a lot of fiction that you would read. So it definitely jumped out and it's like, oh my gosh, this is this is what this is about. All right. Well, and for as serious as it is, especially for how little we read of this to you guys, it doesn't um it doesn't lose its kind of tone where it felt fun and exciting and I don't feel like devastated by what happened to the characters so much it's more I, it was exciting and, and I felt like they both got what they needed right like she got rescued and Kenny got to break out of these chains and realize for himself how he wants to take part in the world right he, he had these inklings about the rules not being right and breaks them at the at the perfect time so it was like a triumph that way it wasn't um sure it wasn't was, a sad yeah. story it was like yeah you did it no it was invigorating yeah yeah it, yeah the, the last like three pages like flew by i was so excited i really love the setup it's so silly and mm-hmm. fun and she's so annoying <laughs> but in a but in an endearing way. This isn't someone I would dislike. If, She's balleting through. Right. Her. It's yeah. like it's, it's way too much. And even her name, I mean Allison Pope, you can just picture her. I knew an Allison Pope and she she looked like <laughs> <laughs> and there's she's doing the ballet and it's like speaking French yeah it's, it's just <laughs> so ridiculous and she's so happy and it's cool to see I kind of think of it as, as colors you have something that's so bright and pink and then like this blackness is just like blots out the sun and it's it's jarring but if, if anything it's just really disturbed I felt disturbed reading that part I mean you just you have this beautiful silly world and then it's just totally blotted out or it's invaded and it, it, there's kind of a dirty feeling to it this this guy you can picture is just totally disturbing disrupting and corrupting the scene and it was so affecting that way yeah so he sh- he shifts the point of view then right is it from from allison's head to kyle's head and then to the bad guy's head and then back to kyle's head and then i think back to the bad guy mm-hmm. and then to her head at the very yeah, end. everybody shares it more or less the last two pages i think yeah yeah and he um at least for kyle's like in the way the new yorkers laid out it's separated and you could tell that we're shifting but i think in other places it was done a little more like subtly in terms of who's speaking yeah like there wasn't the signifier of a big break and a change in the font no but yeah you can tell i think you can tell in the voice by that i don't think it's yeah so once you kind of get the gist well i think maybe maybe he does break it all up anyway uh after that first shift to Kyle, and once you understood the rules, um, it was a lot easier to read and to see why we were shifting at that point, and then to anticipate another shift. I think that's kind of hard sometimes for people to do, but he does it easily here, right? He hits return. 
Yeah, and particularly to give each character their due too. I think that's hard. That's hard for me as a writer. Where sometimes you're just you either side with the character if it's simple as simple as that, or you're just more interested. In, like Allison's story would probably be the least interesting to me as the writer, but she's the one we start with, and we know her just as well as we know Kyle. And I think he gives us just enough of the of the villain too, where you can sympath. You, if you don't sympathize with him, you can at least say, "Well, this guy had an awful upbringing. Of course, he, he could he could end up this bad," which is just nice to see that he's not you know catering to just bad guy good guy which even in serious literature you can see a lot of the time i i like too i thought that was a good w- window into showing us exactly how bad this bad guy was because that was the only way we were going to hear his true intent it wasn't some fantasy that these kids concocted because they don't really know how the world works like he's like this was my plan to rape and, and kill and i i did it recently and it's so logical to him too it has its own logic say well these kings used to do this so i'm going to do this so i've totally he's made his own little logic system which i don't yeah it's nice to see writers when they when they take the time to do that for their characters yeah right they're not painting him as a pure villain they're getting into the nuance of it well i don't know if that's your takeaway but that's a good takeaway the idea that as a writer maybe you favor a character that you've written and the idea of maybe you don't have to switch perspectives but spend more time with a different character and developing that character i do that all the time like i I just focus on one i I don't think i've ever sat back and thought oh christine are you sure this is this person's story i say that to other writers all the time but i think it's easier to see in other people's work absolutely i'm doing a a story that i'm working on right now i'm it's kind of it's kind of stalling and i'm kind of more or less certain that it's just because this one character is just not he's just submerged a little bit he's kind of submerged under the other character it's just way more interesting but the the way that this i mean the other characters the character that i like is only going to get that much better once you have someone to spar with them so oh right so you need to you need the yeah I get I've, it. I've heard of some writers will write from each character's point of view to try to get a sense of who they are just try idea. to not even never winds up in in the story it's just an exercise just a way to figure out the characters mm-hmm. yeah people that do that have a lot of time in their hands yeah however you it, it's, you know there's there's many ways to do it but you figure out a way to get in, in their head Mm-hmm. Even if you're writing from a different point of view, you got to figure out what's in the head of the other character so that they act believably in the first place. And then I would think that would be immediately helpful when you're developing dialogue too, because sometimes if you're just going back and forth between two characters, you can tell without even reading it. Like sometimes the the sentence length will just be like, "This looks like the same person talking to himself." So I would think that developing that character, they're going to have their own little rhythms and things. And yeah, we talked about in that the Raymond Carver episode where the dialogue is like understanding what each character. Um, what they're paying attention to in each moment and that's part of figuring out who the character like what do they care about what are they paying attention to what are they um, motivated by in the conversation and that extends to actions that extends to anything they do in a story is you have to figure out what's in there what, what they're thinking in yeah. order to portray them and have them act believably and uh, against your character you actually care more about. <laughs> yeah, then you can get like a nice tension through the opposition going and then your conflict is there and then your story zips along. That's a really good point with dialogue. I feel like I read that all the time, just flat dialogue because, and a lot of times if you're doing dialogue well, you don't need attribution because we can tell who's talking. Mm-hmm. Yes. And if you need attribution, sometimes it's because like there's no, it's the same depending character. on the scene and really what they're yeah. saying, but sometimes there's, just, there's no other way for me to know who who the hell would have said that? Wow, great point. This reminded me too of uh, Miranda July, the piece that you brought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, yeah. Where it's just, uh, maybe that was first person, but it was stream of consciousness it first, and yeah. it was weird. And I remember talking about like how we would not try to impersonate her, but we would kind of allow ourselves as a takeaway to go with the flow when it comes to weird stuff. Like he, he made up words in this and mm-hmm. it was fun. Yeah, this guy's a major stylist. It's hard to, it's easy to rip off some people, but these people who are so far apart, I mean, maybe it's good for some stuff just to put some pizzazz in your writing just to energize it but it's i find myself not imitating him but just other writers but he seems so particular yeah you might just look ridiculous yeah. trying to, yeah, yeah i don't think you should try but there are probably people for whom this comes naturally and go for it because mm-hmm. it might be weird but we're here for it Cool. So what else do we want to talk about for this one? It kind of merges in with my takeaway, but um, I wanted to talk about psychic distance. Because we talked about, you know, the stream of consciousness and being in each character's head and switching back and forth between the heads. But even when we're in one character's head, he kind of, uh, Saunders kind of shifts how close we are to that character and what what he's showing us about the character and what they're thinking or, or doing. Um, so for example, in this, right at the end 
um, of the section where Kyle, he, he starts his sprint to go after the, um, the bad guy. And, um, right away we're, we're immediately in his thoughts. He's like, no, 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 no. They'd be gone soon. Then he could go inside, call 911. These are like immediate just thoughts that are happening in his head that are kind of driving what he's doing. And then uh, we get, then he was running across the lawn. Oh God, what was he doing? What was he doing? Jesus shit, the directive was he was violating, running in the yard, etc. So it starts off, then he was running is like a... That's a pulling back. That's just, that's an action that you can observe from the outside. But then the rest of that is all right in his head. Um, and then when he gets to the guy, it's no longer in his head anymore. It, it pulls out. It's at remove. He burst out of the creek. The guy's still not turning and let the geode fly into his head. And it goes on a little bit. And then when it hits the guy, it's back in his head. And then it goes, it pulls out of it. So we're going in and out. You know, we're seeing his actions at a remove. Then we're diving in to see his thoughts. And then near at the end of that, his parents start speaking in his head too. Easy, Scout. You're out of control. Slow your motor down, beloved only. And then he responds to those voices by saying, quiet, I'm the boss of me, which is uh, kind of a great moment. But um, we, uh, and I've said this before on the podcast, uh, we often think of point of view as being s- too static. Like third limited is you have to be close to the character, right? And it's like their impressions. But in reality, you know, this pulling back and forth, going in and out is, um, I think he's a virtuoso, so you don't even notice. You don't even, when you're reading this, you don't think about it that way. Unless you, I had to, I went back and like looked for these moments because I was like, this is so well done. But, um, you know, this is something we should really pay attention to in, in our own writing. Yeah, kind of like when you can test the extremes of what the point of view allows, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it is third limited. So you can go, you can dive in and get as limited as possible. Like I'm only going to report the sensory impressions or I'm only going to report the interior thoughts. And then you pull back and say, how far back can I get? Can I, I can talk about what he's doing. I can interpret his actions without seeing his thoughts behind him. Or I can, uh, but, I, you know, you can't go too far at a certain point, right? So, yeah, you're playing with the edges of that. Yeah, but that, but uh, to your point, like you said, if you choose a point of view, even with our last story that we talked about, the second person, yes, that maybe has fewer extremes, but th- that one I think is very limiting. But first person, you can take steps back even and, and explore other things. Yeah, we talked about that in the Edgar Allan Poe story. Yeah, I think sometimes, too, in our workshop, like uh, certain writers will get upset when when they when they think that something has broken a rule it's like well this is but this is first person so why but over here you did this and it's like well did it work though this is this goes back to rob's idea talking about the workshops like you don't need to learn the rules until you've figured out if you're any interested at all in the craft itself yeah and the rule they, there are no rules it's yeah. just guidelines figuring out when the rules actually apply is part of figuring out what the rules are yeah no i love your takeaway on the, on the psychic distance because you can only do that in fiction you can't, yeah, there's no other exactly. art form so, so to see to someone just totally maximizing their medium is, is it's really exciting. Yeah, that's one thing I, I think about a lot is when I'm writing a story is like, how do I make this not a movie? Mm-hmm. It's like, it's getting into mm-hmm. people's thoughts. Like, you can't do that in a movie. You can't do that on TV. If you do narration, it, it always comes off a little wrong. I love narration on movies. I mean, it can work, <laughs> but it's hard to do in a, in a it's a visual medium so mm-hmm. it's not not really made for that but here you can get right into someone's thoughts the way you can't really as cleanly do in, yeah. in, a, in a movie and it, that's what that's what drives interest I think in fiction more so than uh, what drives interest in film so trying to remember that when I'm writing like I got to get in this person's head and I got to show that inner conflict that you can't see on yeah. a screen no that's yeah, this, a great teaching tool this would fail miserably on in a film <laughs> yeah right yeah. I, I would hope it would fail miserably because I think it's so de- it's so well done here. Just watching Alice and Bop around her staircase, you get yeah. pretty boring quickly. The book is better. Okay, so is that kind of your takeaway then? Yeah, that's my takeaway. I just the fluidity of psychic distance, um, and just watching it in the hands of a like I said, a I've used the word for like the fifth time virtuoso. That's great. What about you, Rob? Uh, I'd say these characters are so uh, distinct. And that's that's kind of relates back to what I was saying about how dialogue can be 
so interchangeable is the more distinct you can make your characters, the more opposition they're going to be to each other, the more interesting it's going to be, and the more um, the conflict is going to be way more on the surface. So if you can make these these characters be as much themselves as possible, obviously Saunders does that through the stream of consciousness. He does that through being in their thoughts. He does that through their parents. We kind of have an idea that Allison has her parents wrapped around her finger. That's just an, he doesn't tell us anything to the to the effect of that, but we already know it. We see how she bops around her house as if it's her, her little own little kingdom, whereas Kyle it's much the opposite he's in prison so yeah try to make your characters just john's idea of the exercise where you just write out your character's story and then bring whatever that has to to the story itself that's huge because i think i'm more of this the more i kind of read i think i'm more of the mind where a character really is everything character is going to determine forget conflict character is going to determine the next sentence it's going to determine where you're going in the first place and I can just I can see Alice and Kyle and the bad guy just so so well, not just by by the language, but like how it's propelled forward. Yeah, we talk about significant details. Character determines those too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> John's like, oh, this I is gotta a, bring up significant. I'd like details. to plug my my first book. <laughs> it's in the details by J. C. Brownson. <laughs> All right, let me write that down. <laughs> I think my takeaway would be to try stream of consciousness. I'm sure there's times where I've maybe flirted with that, but I think when I'm writing, I'm so concerned about making something kind of done precisely. You know how I write like usually start to finish and I can't get to the next sentence sometimes if I haven't perfected this one. And so when I do stream of consciousness, if I've ever tried it, I'll have to even, I don't even know if I have because it's it's so easy to, to go off the rails. And that's usually my criticism when I read it and it's not well done. It's like you probably could have cut a third of this. I think there just needs to be, there needs to be better revisions. But yeah. yeah. And so I'm always afraid to do it because um, I never revise anything because I never have time. The deadline is usually right after my first draft is completed. So <laughs> yeah, that's my takeaway to maybe try it. All right. That was good. Thanks, guys.